Anyone? Hi, everyone. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, to reintroduce, this is the Brown Bag uh, Committee's brown, uh, brown Bag Hour. And we are, we, I want to thank our first speaker today, Carrie, for an excellent and informative presentation. Uh, next up, we have Dr. Skylar Bear, who is going to be talking about an environmental DNA or eDNA approach for investigating the reproductive biology of sea scallops. Skylar is a 2018 Canals Fellow in the Senate. Environmental, oh sorry, bleh, the, the Senate Environment and Public Works Committee Minority Office. Skylar received her bachelor's um, in marine biology from Brown University, her master's in biological oceanography from MIT Hui Joint Program, and her PhD in marine biology from the School of Marine Sciences at the University of Maine. Her research focuses on reproduction, ecology, and population dynamics of marine invertebrates. Excited to have you. Thanks, Skylar. Um, can you guys hear me okay? I don't know about all of you out there <laughs> in space. Um, so just to sort of give you a summary up front, if you were at the AFS meeting, this is the same talk. Um, I'm, this talk is designed for anyone who doesn't know anything about eDNA. And there's also um, a bit in the beginning about sort of the motivation for how I ended up here, which has a lot to do with traditional ways of measuring fertilization success in the field. So I have a bit of that and a little bit of explanation of terms in the middle. So if you just want results, you can tune out for a little bit towards the end, until the end. Um, if you are on Twitter, my Twitter is up here in a cool cartoon that you can pay someone 20 bucks to make those for you. Um, it's great, I put on like all my talks. So um, to begin with motivation, um, at NOAA we probably all know that seafood needs to be able to reproduce to create more seafood. You have to allow animals to reproduce um, in order to have more of it to fish or eat or just admire. And um, that means understanding how they produce, where they produce, spawning, uh, fertilization rates, how many of them develop into larvae, where the larvae are, that entire larval black box, okay. Um, and so marine protected areas um, and fishery closure designs really should be considering reproductive requirements. And sometimes uh, with the best available data, we can do a really good job of that. And sometimes we're kind of just guessing. Um, so there's still, there's still a lot of room to sort of figure out uh, because there's a lot of biology we don't know about how animals reproduce to sort of improve uh, those management needs. Um, and the sort of third point on this slide that I really want to make is method of reproduction uh, that is commonplace in the ocean um, across all phyla is broadcast spawning, and that's the release of egg and sperm into the water column where they meet somehow in a very turbulent world. Um, sounds like the dating scene, but it's actually quite literal. And this ranges from finfish. Here's a picture of red snapper spawning. Um, and you can see this beautiful cloud of eggs and presumably sperm. Uh, what these finfish, and actually a lot of finfish are able to do is they come into aggregations, they're able to swim really well. And in a lot of cases, there are fish species whose sperm can only live um, maybe a few seconds because uh, if they're any farther away, then that would never fertilize an egg anyway. So they're adapted to being able to swarm in these aggregations. Then many uh, marine invertebrates like this two-spine sea star, um, release eggs and sperm from the sea floor and sort of hope they're close enough to neighbors. And often these species that might be kind of close to each other, but um, far enough away have sperm and egg adapted to sort of longer time periods of survival so that they might be able to meet. Um, however, there's sort of a lot of question marks on all of those um, characteristics of these gametes. So the study system I spent seven years studying, <laughs> um, PhD and beyond, um, is the sea scallop or Placopectomagellanicus. This is your quick fix. Pairs very well with bacon, as pretty much everyone knows, one of the motivations I assume in harvesting it. Um, very heavily exploited. The federal fishery brings about $500 million a year, doing pretty well. Um, I think it's like second or third right now in terms of uh, fishery species. Someone here at NOAA probably knows better than I do. The Maine fishery brings in about $10 million a year, which is pretty good. Maine, I think, is the only state that has a sea scallop fishery at the moment. 
and it's benefited greatly from fishery closures on George's Bank. Um, some of that might have to do with currents that affect larval circulation, but there's still a lot unknown actually about how reproduction plays into that um, equation. They're gonochristic, meaning they have male and females, occasionally you find hermaphrodites, but it's like one in a thousand or 3,000. And on the right-hand side of the slide, I have a female and a male. The female gonads are um, orange and the male is sort of a white or cream color. And during peak spawning season, before they spawn, um, these gonads can make up like 30 to sometimes 40% of their body weight, um, wet body weight. So spawning scallops um, is sort of an interesting process. I spent seven summers figuring out how to do this. And usually after sort of the peak temperature, highest temperature in Maine, you give them a cold shock for females. It usually has to do with the lunar cycle, although after the last few years, I'm not sure what part of the lunar cycle now. Um, this is a picture of me collecting eggs that have been um, spawned by, by the female scallops. Males actually spawn kind of randomly in comparison. And so coordinating experiments on fertilization can actually be quite difficult. But to figure out when sea scallops are spawning in the field, we'll collect eggs in lab, we steal them, and then we put them in these tiny little nitex mesh chambers that are about 45 microns. The eggs are about 70 microns. So in theory, you can put all these eggs in them, put them out in the field next to some hopefully male scallops. The sperm gets in, maybe fertilizes the eggs, and then the fertilized eggs stay in the chambers. Um, and we hang these next to populations either naturally spawning or uh, under docks where we've isolated them in nets. And so then we collect them after 24 hours and we count all these eggs. Then we score them by stage. Then we come up with a number. And my point here is that this takes a lot of time, a lot of work, and people don't appreciate how much, <laughs> how much it takes just to get some numbers that you hope are like kind of accurate. Um, and so one of the things that we did to look at naturally spawning populations is we would actually put these little chambers on blocks and then we set up these populations that we had used scuba divers to lay them out and sort of hope that they kind of stay there. They don't move too much. And the map on the right side of this slide shows the DMC or Darling Marine Center where we were based. And then the LD site indicates a low density site that we made of scallops and HD indicates high density site. They're about tenfold difference in population density. And so whenever we could get the scallops to spawn in lab, we would deploy the nets or deploy the um, baskets. And then we would get a time series. Um, and the take home here, uh, where you see the sites again on the left and these time series on the right, is that you are seeing these sort of peak spawning events, we think, because these fertilized eggs are being fertilized by sperm in the water. And actually what's most interesting about this experiment is that the high density and low density sites showed peak um, fertilization at the same time of the summer. And actually the low density had about the same fertilization as the high density. So <clears throat> the problem with this method is that spawning season waits for no one. And um, it's really hard to get control of the situation as Harrison Ford is reminding us in this GIF. But, um, you can't, you have to wait for the scallops. You can't sample every day because they don't spawn every day in lab. So what we started thinking about is what about sampling water for eDNA? Maybe we can just capture the spawning events that are happening in the natural population um, without having to get lab scallops to spawn. So what we did is we identified and isolated a genetic marker for sea scallops, which we hadn't really found um, in the literature before. And then we developed a quantitative real-time PCR method to estimate sperm concentration, which presumably is an indicator of a spawning event in both the laboratory and then the field. Um, and I'm gonna walk through some of the terms here now. So if you already know all this, you can just ignore it. Um, so PCR, polyamorous chain reaction, it's a molecular technique used to amplify DNA, small quantities, which uh, it's easier to measure. You can see how much is there. Uh, quantitative PCR is when you measure this um, PCR amplification over time. ITS, which is the region that we isolated, the intergenic transcribed spacer region, 
which is located between the small and large ribosomal RNA genes. So basically, from what I understand, almost every organism has these genes, so it's a very reliable region. Um, it's easy to differentiate between species, and actually there's a paper by, I think, Wang et al. in 2006 that looked at ITS regions for a lot of commercially exploited bivalve species and found that it was um, a really good marker for distinguishing between species when sampling um, bivalve tissue. And then finally, the last thing is that we use a TACMAN method. There's another Cibber Green method, but that we did not use that, if you know what those are. And so basically, you use a fluorescent probe to quantify DNA. And so if you have some questions about that later, I might be able to answer them. Some of them might not, might not be able to. Um, so this is the steps we took. We developed this probe and primer um, after we isolated the, the uh, DNA region, the ITS region. Then we did a clonal dilution series. So we knew what genes we had, and then we created a series to look at CQ, which I'll explain in a minute, um, to create a nice relationship. Then we did a sperm dilution series where we looked at cell count versus gene copy. Um, we did test this out with other species. I don't have time to get into it, but basically we know that this works um, for just sea scallops and it's not gonna attach to any other species. And then we did a field test. So walking through the extraction process, we have a scallop over here on my right shoulder of that cartoon you saw earlier. We extract the DNA from the tissue we isolate um, and clone this ITS region. We actually found eight different variants of this clone. So this is important because when you design probe and primers, you wanna make sure it fits for all the variants um, and you're not just sort of targeting one variant. Um, then we sequenced all of these and then we came up with our probe and primers um, with a program called Allele ID. So simple enough. Um, next, we looked at uh, the CQ value, which some people here might know what that means, but basically you have a fluorescent threshold that you're looking for your, your sample to cross, um, and it's over a number of PCR cycles of warming and cooling. And the number that we cared about is called the CQ value, which is when your sample crosses a fluorescent threshold at what PCR cycle, and that's what CQ is. And if it crosses earlier at a lower CQ value, that means you have more DNA of your um, target region. So um, we tested out this method on our clones. We found a very, very nice linear relationship. So we know that this works really well. Um, if anyone cares, there's a little table on the bottom of the probes and primers, but I'm submitting this in a couple of days. So hopefully it'll be in the literature soon. Next. We got the males to spawn, which is hard. Um, and we did, uh, we did five sets of um, these sperm dilution series where we collected concentrated gametes and did dilutions twice. Um, and then we did cell counts. So the dilution series, uh, you have the five series. So those are the five different times that we did this and we diluted them by tenfold each time. And we did the cell count that we extracted across the dilution series and the gene copy number. And this is actually a very good relationship. Um, who I work with, who's Pete Countway, who's an expert in these matters, so that this was like a very clean line. So this is great because what this means is when we take our field samples, we can get um, the CQ value, then the gene copy number, and then sort of guesstimate how many sperm cells we're getting. So, for the field methods, we collected scallops by scuba, then we held some of them in a lantern net so we knew they weren't going anywhere, and then we did sampling during what we thought was the spawning season. And we sampled only on low and high tides because we wanted the least amount of water movement as possible, and then we filtered these samples um, with a 20 micron filter, and that's because we were specifically looking for sperm. Anything above 20 microns could be eggs, it could be pseudo feces, it could be all sorts of things. Um, so size fractionation is actually really important for us to target after those sperm. And then we also did this thing where we followed the gonad index. Um, gonad indices are traditional method of detecting spawning by basically killing animals, dissecting them, and seeing what percentage of their body weight changes. So we did the traditional like murder method at another site. 
to see if it uh, corresponded with some of the, um, the peaks we were expecting to get from our samples. So this is, so this is the big slide if you're paying attention somewhere else. Um, we, we tried to sample actually the most when we thought they were going to spawn around September 12th, which actually wasn't when they spawned. Um, they seem to be spawning towards the end of August and end of um, September. And we had um, really these sort of two very clear peaks, which we were actually not expecting. And when you look at the gonad indices, um, and I've highlighted it in yellow, these regions where you see a decline in gonad index, which in indicates that there's some spawning, and these, these peaks um, are within those declines. So that implies that these are actually from spawning events. So in summary, we isolated these new regions, which is very exciting to us anyway. Um, we developed this really species-specific probe and, and primer set, and then we were actually able to detect spawning in near real time, which is huge because for invertebrates, like I haven't been able to find anyone else doing this yet. Um, for future work, there's, this is actually part of an EPSCOR proposal that hopefully will get funded. Um, and we're hoping that maybe we can use this eDNA method to track both spawning events and also larval supply, which people have done work on, but we could do more of it. And we can expand beyond scallops. So that's it. Thank you for your attention and hope I didn't bore you too much. So. So I'm curious how long the, the sperm and eggs are viable and how that relates to eDNA. Is it possible that you're picking up DNA, but the sperm and eggs are, are not viable with the DNA pregnancy are floating out? Um, it is possible. Oh, sorry. Uh, the question was um, how long eggs and sperm are viable, and if they aren't viable anymore, is it possible to still pick up the DNA, right? Right. Okay. So sperm can live, I think, a couple hours. Eggs can are still viable for about up to 24 hours, we think. That's sort of like really the end. Um, of course, you can pick up DNA, I'd assume. Uh, I think what's more interesting in, in this case and our results is the, the peaks, like the difference, because there is sort of a background level that we're picking up, those lower dots, um, and that might be, you know, anything, but the fact that there's so many um, would indicate, based on the size fractionation, that it could be. But but if it were a bunch of sperm, maybe you caught a, a spawning event that's only a couple hours old, which is better than gonad indices, which usually is just month or maybe week. I mean, the problem with gonad indices is it's lethal. So you're killing off your population, and if with like sea scallops, you don't have that many to kill, um, it can actually impact your study quite a bit. I don't know if that answers your question. Any other questions? No? So you could extract could you could you not take both DNA or is that that was that part of it? That was the extraction part. We took like mantle tissue from the cartoon much earlier. Um, and then that's how we got our our DNA um, clones and then designed our probes and primer off of the adult. DNA. So I'm just thinking, you know, I'm thinking about, you know, if we're like looking at MPAs or whatever and you want to find viable habitat, you know, would it be possible to look at, you know, sample certain area to determine, okay, well, what was the origin of those? Is that through this process or that? Yeah, I think there are a lot of, oh, the question, right. Um, I'm sorry, you're going to have to say it again, I think. So does the can the DNA be detected in different? Can you go and, and sample in an area and, and be able to take DNA from adults? Yeah. And determine where their origin may have been. So the, when you have body caps body like you did. the question is, if you take DNA from adults in different areas, can you detect broadcast spawning, like where the origin of them are? So. The, so then your question is more about like within a population, like population genetics level. This is a species level. So I'm sure that you could get to that point. Um, if you're curious about, okay, this, this genetically distinct 
a population of adults versus another, right, within a species. Um, that would require sort of another level of genetics. This is only species specific, so that's as much as this will tell you. But for population genetics, I'm sure someone could work on it. Yeah. Uh, we do have a couple questions online. Okay. Um, so the first one is, uh, could this or would this lead to on-site sensors that might trigger commercial activities? Uh, if they had a series of buoys that would notify interested parties of a spawning event and would that influence decision makers about changing operations? Do I need to repeat your question? Okay. Um, it could. I mean, if you have a spawning event and then you know the, um, if you're concerned about whether or not you're harvesting that area and if you want to know if it's like, say, a source of larvae, but you're getting a lot of spawning activity, maybe it'd be a good idea to close it or study it better. Um, if you're interested in how much larval output and the origin, so you can inform it into models to figure out maybe what kind of larval sets, bat set, or whatever you're going to get that year. So it really depends, I think, like what you want to do, but you could definitely do something like that, which I think is one of the hopes of, of proposals like the EPSCOR um, project out of Maine and Bigelow. Thank you. Um, we have another question. How far away from the spawning event do you think you will be able to detect the scallops? Um, that's a great question. We played it super safe with our little field study because this is the first time we did it. So it was sort of a methodological development. And we hung them in nets and we took samples right next to the net at low or high tides, so slack tides. So it's a great question. Um, we don't know yet. Um, and could there have been other scallop cells um, that could be in the water column that you also detected? Yes, and so that's why when you look at that figure I have, um, there are baseline values, um, and what we really cared about are those peaks. So th we're assuming there's got to be, you know, they're sloughing off cells, there's, there's pseudo feces and regular feces and all sorts of stuff in the water. Um, so what we were most thrilled about were those peaks and the fact that those peaks were at a size of less than 20 microns, which indicates prob that it's probably sperm. Uh, one more question. Why do you think the peak in spawning was different between sets of years? Uh, global climate change, affecting temperature, salinity, etc. Yeah, that's a great question. Uh, I'd like to know the answer to. Um, but probably 2012, uh, which is what that first set of data I had from sort of the hard labor method of <laughs> fertilization studies, 2012 is an exceptionally warm year. And um, those scallops spawned in like early, or no, um, early for what we thought they would, but it was like late July. And since then, we watched them spawn later and later every year. I am convinced that there's some sort of lunar um, Q involved. We are also on a tidal estuary, so it may not be like exactly lunar, but it might be more of a tide flow um, Q. But it's a really good question, and I do not know the answer. Yeah. Um, and last one, uh, this research, can it be applied to other species? Yes, that's the hope. So I did scallops because it's what I studied forever, and it was really easy. Um, but, you know, it'd be great to do it for lots of species. And there's actually, there's, a, there's some literature from about 10 years ago where a bunch of people did this with larvae. And they did it for all sorts of species. And then it just seemed to, the literature, some of it just seemed to kind of disappear. Maybe it was too expensive or not interesting. But it seems like um, now that this technology is a lot cheaper and more accessible, that these kinds of more larger scale versions of these projects might be much more useful to industry and management. Thanks. Um, I just had a question about the, the when you saw the two peaks, the time course. Oh, I can't remember from your figure, but how often did you sample? Yeah, so sure, if that's great. I had the clicker here. And this might be actually. Um, so we sampled, because it was literally just me, and um, we had basically no funds to do this project, so it was one I could, while I was working on another project. Um, 
So we went, I went the most, which was daily and actually sometimes twice a day that week in September. And then um, for the other ones, it was like once or twice a week. And that was based on um, what I've seen with gonad indices declining when they often decline and during what part of the lunar phase I've seen them decline. Um, and sort of a side note, this is male focused, um, but most of my work has been female focused and they seem to be, which oddly, they seem to be picking up different cues or they're just not quite synced up, so. Uh, any more questions? Okay, thank you so much. Thank you.